and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Cosmic Catastrophe on Revolution.Radio. I'm your host, Diamond, from the Oppenheimer Ranch Project. Joining us today, once again, is my lovely partner and co-host, Leah Shaper. Hello. We have a great show planned for today. Now, I, we've never started a show where I said it's going to be a terrible show, so there is that. <laughs> Well, that's good. <laughs> We're going to be talking about some topics that are in the news, including, but not limited to, in the first half, the polar vortex and its use as a propaganda weapon. Mm-hmm. So that'll be interesting because some of the headlines coming out are claiming that global warming causes cooling. Yeah, which which is interesting in the sense that we do have a pretty big cold shift coming up, and it, it seems like this is all in anticipation of that. Yes, a good way to explain why it's so cold outside. Yes. You got to explain we'll t- it before it happens, you know? Yeah, we'll talk about the actual science, which causes this effect uh, when the polar vortex breaks in two, or sometimes the flow, the jet stream goes from zonal to meridional. This is all part of the concept of Rosby waves, which are moving all the weather around the Earth. So we'll talk about those. And we'll break it down. In the second half, we have a very interesting discussion that we're going to be discussing the Doug Vote Micronova concept and why the evidence they use uh, to prove that theory is bunk. It's also the the evidence that we're going to be showing you is can also be used to debunk crustal slip, uh, the Hapgood idea, or any of those other ideas. So Hmm. we'll get to that in the second half. We'll break it down. We're going to talk about the coquinos that are in Florida. Um, these are shell beds that have been deposited during the last ice age. We'll talk about what they are and that they are not evidence of a giant tsunami. Because yeah. I don't know if you know, a tsunami is not going to deposit a, a micro shell bed on Florida. It, it's going to wash it across. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but that's the beginning of their problems. The dating of all the frozen mammoths, none of them line up within any date that's 12,800 years ago. They're all much older And these coquinos are much older as well. And then we'll also talk about the deep submarine canyon problem. And in fact, there is no problem. So we'll get all that. So are you ready? Buckle up, buttercup. I'm ready. All right, let's talk about the global warming idea to begin with here. Let me know if you can see the screen. Yes. So there's a very cold plume of air that's going to be coming down from Canada in the next week or so. The models are so far out that there is no clear consensus of where this plume is going to go, but it's definitely going to be near uh, Western Canada somewhere with temperatures in Fahrenheit of 50 degrees below zero. Yeah. That's, that's very cold. Well, and even the conservative models would sort of push a lot of things towards minus 30, which obviously is also very cold. And so the headlines prior to the weather event that are around the globe now are similar to this one, albeit this one is uh, over a decade old, that global warming may trigger cooling. (laughs) And in fact, I've seen on, uh, I I watched some videos on Twitter yesterday where there were, I believe it was an international weather channel, maybe it was the UK, but they were talking about how record cold in Lapland. It's been the coldest in Norway and Finland and Sweden for four decades. Mm -hmm. Some of the highest snow totals ever in a single day recorded for decades or ever in Norway. Mm -hmm. I shared some photos last night and the weather person is explaining all these records being broken because of global warming. (laughs) It's so ridiculous. I mean, even for even for like the dumbest person, that's ridiculous. Right. right? So unless this, they unless they were are, are able to show like how much warmer it is somewhere else and how it's canceling out that cold and therefore the average temperature is this. Unless you can do that, you can't convince people. Maybe you can. I don't know. I mean, 
people do seem to be getting dumber, but they're more gullible. Well, and the same reasoning now is the same as it was uh, 10 or 12 years ago. Arctic melting can lead to cooler temperatures and increase snowfall in lower latitudes. Mm -hmm. And so they mm -hmm. use the concept also sudden stratospheric warming. That's that's brand new. You, you've heard that a lot over the last few years, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is the sudden stratospheric warming is what causes the polar vortex to split. It's burning up in the Arctic. And that's why it's so cold down here. There is a shift, an imbalance in what's going on. Except that that's not even what the data shows. There's no data that shows that it's burning up in the Arctic. That doesn't exist. Well, depending on where you look in the Arctic, you can find it warming. These sudden stratospheric warming events are up in the stratosphere, which are not on the surface of the Arctic, which mm -hmm. is where the ice is and where it's cold. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to bring up some facts about the Arctic. The Arctic ice has been low some of the lowest amounts recently. And you can see here, this, what we're looking at here is Arctic sea ice minimum. So if you want to see these graphics, you got to rewatch the podcast over at Magnetic Reversal News later tonight, 8 p.m. But this is coming from the NSIDC and the OSI. These are the two number one Arctic data sets. And you could see the lowest Arctic ice ever recorded in recent history. And I say recent because they, they don't show the data from the 70s and we don't have much data prior to that. Yeah. Uh, they have one low date here, and it's in 2012. That yeah. was the Arctic sea ice low. Since yeah. then, take a look in general. It's been basically the same with it's just up and down since 2007. Yeah, it's like a flat trend. So Yeah, but take a look at the right side of the graph. It is off the charts because <laughs> the right. Arctic sea ice minimum this month is the yeah. highest in 20 years. Yeah. Yeah, it's off the graph yeah. to the vertical. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so there is no Arctic, there's no Arctic ice uh, reduction. There is no uh, Arctic ice nightmare. The Al Gore hypothesis of no Arctic ice in the summer is impossible, especially now that the data is has been has left the graph since 2007. Well, also, I mean, Al Gore's prediction, right, is that the Arctic would have been ice free by 2014, 10 years ago. <laughs> that's so, certainly clearly that's not true so the same exact things that are happening today that they're blaming on global warming back in the 70s they were blaming on a new ice age yeah and so you can see here the graph of the breakdown of the jet stream where it gets wavy and they were showing that arctic cold is now going to go all the way down towards florida and mexico and the ice age is going to begin up in canada and this is just the beginning mm -hmm. But the problem was that there was a very weak solar cycle in the 70s, mm -hmm. which is very similar to what we're experiencing now. Mm -hmm. And it is the weak sun that breaks down the jet stream, not global warming, not CO2, not plant mm -hmm. food, certainly. Mm -hmm. And the same propaganda they were using in the 70s for a cooling world is the same propaganda they're using now for a warming world. You know, it's really interesting when you read through that article you were just showing from, I think that was from 76. It, it, when you look at the details of the article, it's interesting to see that some of the details in their theory, they take the same details and then reverse the conclusion. It's as if the, the current uh, proponents of globalist proponents of global warming went back and read this article and said, okay, how can we use some of the science and turn it into something else? Because Here's the impression I get when I read the articles from the 70s. Um, I get the impression that like they weren't totally wrong, right? It was actually cooling where they went wrong was in the extremity of what was happening. Like they're talking about this going into another ice age, which obviously wasn't the case, right? We know more now about grand solar minimums and which ones are bigger than others, um, and, 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 you know, we can see that there's a larger cycle where we'll, we'll have solar minimums, but it doesn't mean grand solar minimum, but there is a larger pattern of grand solar minimums. And maybe we didn't know that at that point, maybe there was also a reason to scare people in this time frame. I'm not really sure. Right. But what's interesting here, if you look at the bottom square yeah. here, I'm, I'm looking at the study mm -hmm. that was released in the 1970s, remember mm -hmm. by NOAA 
notes that the amount of sunshine reaching the ground in the continental U.S. diminished by 1.3 percent between 1964 and 72. Yeah, which caused the cooling, the right. sun, the right. sun. So they just... knew the sun caused. I mean, it's insane. Right. I mean, that's that's on. what I'm saying. It's like they're not they're not completely wrong in the 70s. It just wasn't as bad as it was being portrayed. Whether that was the 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 misportrayal, whether that was due to other motivations or honest error, I don't know. But like, yeah, it was getting cooler. And you know, you and I talked about this recently. How like in the 80s, for example, we had tons of snow in the Northeast, which is something that we haven't really seen since. And that's a product of a cooling planet due to changes in our sun and our interaction with our sun. Yeah, so in the early 80s, that was like we were coming out of this weak solar cycle, which lasted right. for two decades. It, it was the full solar cycle was weak, and then the minimum was weak. So it, it lasted quite some time. Yeah. And here you can see uh, August 21st, 2023. This is coming from <laughs> UCLA. Stratospheric <laughs> cooling, the concerning flip side of global warming. <laughs> it's so confusing that no one could even make sense of any of the science if they tried to. This article cracks me up, right? This is supposedly based on a study and it's complete hogwash, even just from reading the summary, this article about the research, right? Like, okay, they talk about, what they're talking about is that the upper stratosphere doesn't re really, re how, how, do, how do I summarize this? Help me out here. The upper stratosphere it makes it easier to pick out the effect, the human effect on climate. But at the same time, in the same breath, they acknowledge that up until, I don't know exactly what the date is, but this researcher, Benjamin Santer at UCLA, he talks about how um, there was a long period of time where satellite data wasn't even able to give us the data for the upper stratosphere. We could only get 15 miles up, not 30 miles up. And then they make these claims like um, we see that the that um, natural variations could only cause this amount of cooling versus human activity. Well, if we weren't able to study the upper stratosphere during the critical period of human global warming, because they're talking about a 30 year period between 1986 and 2022. So how do they know? what part of the cooling could only be the result of natural effects and not humans? How do they know that? If we couldn't study this, then how could we possibly know that? They don't. How and they're so bold. They go out on the limb here and they say that the temperature changes in the stratosphere are 12 to 15 times greater yeah. than what could have been caused by nature based on nothing. Exactly. <laughs> right. Like how, how can you make that determination if you couldn't even study that stratosphere? Uh, yeah, like this says, the new research shows that from 1986 to 2022, the human produced greenhouse gases that caused warming of the Earth's surface and the troposphere also led to a mean cooling of about 1.8 to 2.2 degrees Celsius in the middle and upper stratosphere globally. In contrast, global mean stratospheric temperature changes caused by natural variations were no lar larger than about 0.15 degrees Celsius over the same period. How do you know that? I mean, meanwhile, they're like, you know, the, the hypothesis of global warming, right, is that we've been warming since industrialization. So let's say since 1880, you know, and they reference that read that here, that we've warmed by 1.1 C. Well, we certainly didn't have satellites in 1880 to study the upper stratosphere and know what the temperature changes would have been. So what the hell are they talking about? Yeah, this is a, gl a global warming funding paper that you get money by producing a result. In this case, global warming causes global cooling in the stratosphere, and it's your fault. That's all the paper says. <laughs> it's not really based on any science. It's a propaganda piece. Well, and part of what they say here too, right, is that it's like the greenhouse gases are trapping the heat in the troposphere, in the lower part of the atmosphere. And, you know, that's why the stratosphere stays cool. And it's like, that doesn't make any sense either, right? Like that's not going to make the stratosphere cool because guess what? We still have solar radiation coming in and hitting the stratosphere all the time. So <laughs> it doesn't make sense in any way, shape or form. Well, let's talk about what's actually happening here. And it has nothing to do with you or CO2. 
Mm -hmm. we're not probably going into an ice age anytime soon. Those take hundreds, if not over 1,500 years to to descend into an ice age. That's quite a, a bit of time. And over your lifetime, you won't notice it. But what does happen in a lifetime is changes in the jet stream um, in a decadal scale. And now this is driven by many things, but... And there's very few, there's very little consensus on what actually is going on here. Now, the mm -hmm. process itself of Rosby waves has been used to describe these intricate patterns. It's a great video. Let's just blow this up while we're talking. The intricate patterns of weather moving around the earth due to high and low pressure systems determine these, these patterns. The, and they call them Rosby waves. Uh, if you go look into the literature on what the what causes these Rosby waves to change direction and position. They give you some gobbledygook about topography and blah, blah, blah. But mm -hmm. Rosby waves can occur anywhere at any time. They're not controlled by topography. So mm -hmm. there's instances of them being everywhere on the planet at any given time. Mm -hmm. They're not like locked into a pattern. As you can well, see clearly, here, <laughs> the weather system is moving everywhere across the surface. Yeah. Now, what does happen is you can get a, a higher and lower penetration from the Arctic. See here, we're looking at a strong zonal flow with that straight mm -hmm. line. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the systems break down and the Rosby waves form deep troughs. I'm sure you've heard of that or mm -hmm. blocking patterns. And that's when you get these huge dips of polar air down all the way towards Florida, like the one that's coming in a week or so. Yeah. Now, and we've been seeing that for a couple of years now. Big dips yeah. of, of cold air that sink down into the United States in a way that we haven't really seen in recent history. Yeah, and the, and, and the reasoning may be all of these weather patterns on Earth, high and low pressure systems, the circular areas you can see that are spinning around, those are equivalent to sunspots on the sun. Mm -hmm. And these, they're just Earth spots on the Earth. They're, they're areas of positive and negative electrical charge on the surface. So all of these weathers, weather patterns are being controlled by electrical patterns on the surface, which mm -hmm. we call high and low pressure systems when we report on weather. If they started calling them positive and negative earth spots, it, people's heads would explode. Yeah. But, <laughs> but it's a lot in more fact, <laughs> yeah, it's what's going on. And it's all controlled by the energy that comes into the earth. Mm -hmm. The more energy coming into the earth, the more energy in these Rosby waves, which is why when we see solar storms, massive solar storms on the surface of Earth, sometimes they intensify the power of hurricanes. Mm -hmm. So that would be the energy coming in, intensifying these Rosby waves. Now, it is hypothesized. There's no consensus because there's very few people collect, uh, connecting electrical patterns, the sun and weather that... When the sun shuts down over long periods of time, the Rosbys may break down. Mm -hmm. It's We saw a very strong zonal flow when we were younger because we were at solar max. Yeah. So it may be solar max and you get a stronger zonal flow. And at solar minimum, you get more meridional flow because of the breakdown of the jet stream. Mm -hmm. We got a couple great papers here that have the fluid dynamics of the whole process of these Rosby waves. But uh, it's electric. That's the easiest way to look at it. Mm -hmm. And so zonal flow is a more flat, straight across the country, meridional as more up and down. Any comments on that? Nope. So what we should be seeing, and this is the bad news that, that I'm going to get to right before the break, is that Solar Wilcox Observatory and several other sources have all confirmed that the sun's solar polar fields, the north and the south, have reversed. Yes. This is the shortest solar cycle that may occur in the last 300 years. Yeah. The prediction for solar max was not until next year. And so solar max is behind us. Yeah. The dates that Wilcox gives is April 2023 for the for the first solar polar field reversal and then October 2023 for the second solar polar field. So the full reversal 
Solar Max was October of last year. Yeah. We we're already dropping down into solar minimum. Yeah. And a lot of people aren't going to like that. Meaning grand solar minimum, not just a simple solar minimum. Well, we're dropping down into deeper into the grand minimum, but this is, we are now dropping down into solar minimum of cycle 25. Yeah. 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 Which we've talked about large volcanic eruptions at these weak solar cycles occur at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking for a VI six or seven, it should happen from three to seven years from now mm -hmm. at the bottom and then coming out of into cycle 26. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good, th a good prep, <clears throat> but according to almost all sources, solar polar fields have reversed, which means we're now dropping out down into solar minimum cycle 25 solar max is behind us. October of 2023 was solar max for cycle 25, which didn't get much higher than 115 sunspots. Yeah. So we could take a quick look at all that. We're over here at Solon.info. There's that peak here back mm -hmm. when we were kids that caused all that snow. Yeah. And here's the Ice Age scare, that one cycle. Yep. That's it. Yeah. It lasted I mean, from look 1960 at, to 75. Right. Right. Which is not even that big a deal. I mean, look at, you know, 1800 to 1840. You know, well, that, that was the Dalton minimum. <laughs> it was the Dalton minimum, right? So uh, this is when the Thames freezes over and all of that. So, yeah, so we're really scared, easily fear mongered with a cycle that's this strong <laughs> claiming an well, ice age is happening. I mean, and look, since 1750, that's basically the, the least extreme solar minimum period of anything that we've seen since 1750. And that's... <laughs> <laughs> that's that that's when there was this fear mongering <coughs> i mean <coughs> it's kind of a shame that it happened that way right because one of the things that i often see happening let's say on social media is that um people will reference the 1970s ice age scare and say see they were trying to scare us then too and it was all bs and that's part of the reason why earlier i said well i don't think they were entirely wrong but the extremity that they were suggesting that was going to happen was completely incorrect. So it's a shame because now people completely discount all of that when it wasn't totally incorrect and it has a lot of bearing on what's happening now. So it's kind of unfortunate. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Um, here we're looking at the last three solar cycles and the green data, the projected is pretty much where we are right now. Mm -hmm. So what we can glean from this is that solar cycle 25 and 24 are very similar. They're, 25 was not much higher. Mm -hmm. So here's the max of 24. This will probably be the max of 25. And as we drop back down early, this line should come down very early. And the sunspot, uh, the sun, solar cycle 25 may end in as little as 10 years. Yeah. Instead of 11. Yeah. Could even be 9.5. And I don't know what the implications of that are. We should have Zarkov on. If this is particularly short, it could be the canceling out of those waves, meaning that cycle 26 could be non-existent. Right. Or even shorter, maybe another nine-year thing with barely a peak. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to be alive for it. And that's the good news. We're going to be here to see what's happening. This is the first time that anyone may witness with all this data, what is going on on the sun. And before you leave this graph, I mean, you can oh. also- Oh, let me get it. You can see from this graph that oh, that's over right. time, <laughs> there's a progression yeah. of cycles getting weaker and weaker and weaker, right? So cycle 21 is in blue, and that's when we have the strongest solar max peaks. And then cycle 22 is in black, and they decrease some more. Cycle 23 is in red, they decrease some more. So there's a, there's a progression over time of these cycles getting weaker and weaker. And here, what we're looking at is the weakest solar cycles going back into the 1800s the five weakest, and there is our current solar cycle still coming in top three. Yeah. Top three weakest since the Dalton minimum. So it can get worse. <laughs> it can get much worse. And we may, in fact, I think 
have a cycle that comes in way down here for cycle 26. Yeah. I'm going to predict 75 sunspot max for 26. And that's that's pretty extreme. It's an ex extreme. But many people think that uh, grand solar minimum means no sunspots. No, that's clearly not the case. Right. It means some, just very few. I mean, the sun doesn't completely stop functioning. You know, we use the word shutdown, but it's not a complete shutdown. Yes. And even a, a, a lessening of solar activity over a period of decades, that can weaken the magneto, the, our magnetic field here on Earth. Yes. And, and clearly and that's fact, already happened. Yeah. We are currently in a magnetic excursion. The field has been weakening for hundreds of years. It's certainly not because of this grand minimum that this, the field is weakening. Yeah. Yeah. People need it, to understand that. It's it's interesting. I was thinking earlier when you mentioned, um, you know, that we should be looking for larger volca volcanoes. I was just getting this instinctual uh, push on the idea of that there's something about how when the magnetosphere weakens that it's like almost taking the pressure off that's allowing those volcanic eruptions to happen. That's, a, that's an interesting way to think about it because during some of these magnetic excursions, large volcanoes go do go off. Yeah, yeah. So there's something something about our field being less polarized that it allows that to happen. That's the impression I get anyway. Well, the peer-reviewed paper that came out about five years ago showed that increased cosmic rays can excite and heat the magma in siliceous-rich uh, volcanoes. Right, right, right. So in that case, it might be that it's cosmic rays that are charging these VEI six, seven eruptions over long periods of time. And then when we reach the bottom, they have the ability to blow. Yeah. So that's kind of the opposite concept. Cause it's like, you're, you're energizing that magma basically. Yep. And creating a situation where it wants to explode. Well, we, we went bumperless again on this show. Yes, we did. Look at that. I didn't even notice. All right. Before we change topics to the Micronova and crustal slip, and the evidence against it, um, I think we should sum this all up with Tony Heller. His, he's shifting his focus over the next year. He's created some new software, and he's sick and tired of the lies. Yeah. So let's just hear him out here. And if you can, follow Tony Heller over at YouTube. I don't have any sound. Do you have sound? Yes. So what his graph's showing here is that the temperature typically corresponds to the solar cycles here, the temperature peaking in 1998 in Costa Rica. But in all the adjusted graphs coming from NASA and NOAA over the last two decades, they all went from cooling trends like this one to warming trends. And this is called raw data, which shows cooling. And all of the, just, the data in the last two decades now is adjusted. Mm -hmm. And this is what adjusted data, this is the same data set adjusted. <laughs> it, it, what they did was they eliminated the warmest part here completely. They just took away the data. <laughs> this is the warmest data and they remove it and they, get, and it goes from cooling to warming. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so Tony Heller is sick of the fraud and you should be too. Yeah. You can also find uh, Tony Heller on Twitter and he's got a lot of, or X, I should say, he's got a lot of great posts on there illustrating the lies and the d data manipulation. Very, very yeah, much Yeah, and his worthwhile. website is realclimatescience.com. Okay, rolling over to the second half of the show. We don't have much time and there's so much awesome information here I want to share. Um, that is not what I want to share and I think I might have erased <laughs> the paper. Uh-oh. 
<laughs> yeah. So we, I did have a paper up here, the Doug vote paper, <clears throat> and you don't probably have a copy of it. Darn it. Well, regardless, I will link it below. And what it is, is August Dunning had put up, I don't know, do you remember where it was? Is it on ResearchGate? Um, yes, it is on ResearchGate. I don't have my, where I had it up with me. And basically what he did is he made a video, which he probably, pre he presented at Ben Davidson's Observing the Frontier in 2000, in 2020, I think. It's dated. Mm -hmm. But he was in the video supporting the evidence of Doug Vogt's Micronova hypothesis. Now, the Micronova hypothesis is that the sun goes nova every 12,600 years or so. I don't have the exact date. And during that, right before that process, the magnetic field on Earth flips, it goes to zero, and the Earth stops spinning, which causes the oceans to wash over the world. <laughs> um, and then the sun fries everything on the surface. <laughs> For 18 days or something like that. It's crazy. Right. <clears throat> now, some of the evidence that uh, August Dunning uses is coquina. The coquina beds in Florida. Now, coquina is a sedimentary rock composed either wholly or almost entirely of transported, abraded, and mechanically sorted fragments of mollusks, trilobites, and brachiopods, or other invertebrates. So it's literally a sedimentary rock of animal shells. Not many sediments. The sediments are the shells. Yeah. Sometimes it's called a shell lag deposit because it's a deposit of all shells and they're typically deposited when a high tide pushes in a shell lag and then the tide goes back out and leaves the pile there there you got it's the like lag. exactly what you see on the beach like during a normal tide right you have waves coming up and it leaves a line of debris from the ocean right but now these lags are different because they are extensive and they move laterally. So it's not just a thin line like a beach. Mm -hmm. They're on the surface. So they're found inland in Florida. Mm -hmm. And they're all 12,800 years or older, dating all the way back to about 2 million, the entire length of the Ice Age, when the sea level was much lower. Mm -hmm. And the fauna contained in these, take a guess, is it oceanic, do you think? Or is it estuary? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's estuary because the sea level is nowhere near. It's 300 yeah. feet lower. Yeah. So these are bay deposits on the center of Florida. Florida is still connected to the ocean somehow in the estuaries. And periodically, these deposits are being, um, during storms, are being deposited and then preserved. So it is a storm deposit, but... In uh, August Dunning's video, he uses it as proof of the ocean washing over Florida. I don't, I don't even see the connection. Like, that doesn't right. make any sense. Another problem is that these fauna that are found in the coquina are fauna that are exclusive to the Florida Peninsula. They didn't come from somewhere else. Yeah, so well, that's a huge problem. Yeah, so if it came from, if these were shells from California, I could believe him. <laughs> Right, right. I, I wondered about that when I was listening to that because he, he's, I mean, he's literally saying something which indicates that huge volumes of material from one geographic location would have to be deposited, deposited in another location, but we're not actually seeing that. No. I mean, so, I'm sure, I'm sure that some people be like, oh yeah, that must be right, you know, because I can find shells up on a mountain, but that's for a completely different reason that's millions of years old. It, it, they're not millions of years old. And what's more important is that in certain areas, the, the shells themselves are specifically uh, identified as the clam Donax verabilis. This clam still lives in the shallow waters in coastal Florida. So these didn't come from anywhere else. They're from here and they were deposited where they're from. <laughs> <laughs> so that evidence is is bunk. That that has something to do with the tsunami washing over the earth. Mm -hmm. The smoking gun that Doug Vogt had that August Dunning supports is the presence of submarine canyons on the continental slopes. 
Do you know this argument? Yeah. So the argument is if you go over here to the continental shelf and you look, do you see all these canyons? Mm -hmm. And some of them extend way out into the abyssal plain. Mm -hmm. The argument is that the only way this can happen is if the, the Atlantic Ocean completely drained as it sloshed over um, Africa and then the Pacific washed over the U.S. and fell off these cliffs these giant cliffs that were exposed and created these canyons. Now, do you, does that sound plausible? Well, I mean, there's a completely viable alternative explanation <laughs> was, is that it, at some point sea level was significantly lower than it is now. Oh my God, that is brilliant. <laughs> Here's what's even more brilliant. The average depth of the coastal plain to the edge is 200 to 300 feet. So if yeah. you lower sea level to ice age levels, then the ocean would, this would be the shoreline. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, here's the other thing that immediately debunks that stupid wash over theory. These submarine canyons do not only exist on the Eastern flanks of continents. Right, right. Let right. me show you, let me just prove that. Right. So th the idea is that the, the Atlantic washed over Africa here mm -hmm. uh, in from left to right. Right. And then on this side of the continent, there'll be all those things, right? The largest mm -hmm. submarine canyon in the entire world is on the western side of Africa in the Congo. It's where the yeah. Congo River, look at that. It's like a thousand yeah. miles long. It's where right. the Congo River uh, dumps out of Africa to the west. So yeah. this cannot be explained by a tsunami washing from the left to the right. I mean, one of the objections that he brings up, right, is that uh, fresh water will not sink below salt water. But again, if you sea level is lower, then that's how you would get this canyon. This happened when you, sea level was 300 feet lower. Yes. Right. You don't need you don't need a fresh water salt water explanation here. OK. And just logically, let's think logically. I don't know if there's any logic left. <laughs> there are deposits of turbidity currents all over the earth. And these are actually the deposits that happen through due to these. Most of these are landslides that occur. So mm -hmm. once sea inundates this cliff again, it's so steep that small currents down here can cause failure because it's saturated sure. and they, and it's regular due sure. to storms that wash over top. They regularly, Turbidity flows go down these cliffs, and some of them are thousands of, or if not miles thick of these turbidity currents. Yeah. There's evidence of these turbidity currents on the surface. In the Ordovician, we have examples all over the U.S. You can go look at them. So not only do we have examples of seeing them in real time, we also have rock examples of them happening. Yeah. So I just wanted to get that off my chest. Yes. But, uh, and, a, and a couple other things. Um... I already said that these deep submarine canyons are all over the world on all sides of continents, mm -hmm. northern, eastern, western, and southern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of the submarine canyons can form in under the ocean. Submarine canyons are formed often near the mouths of rivers, but strong river currents can cup deeply into soft material of the continental shelf itself, mm. just like they erode rocks. Mm -hmm. So it, it can be, if you have a strong enough current pushing out into the ocean, that a canyon can be eroded. Mm -hmm. uh, there are thousands of submarine canyons in all oceans on all sides. So there's no evidence of a tsunami washing one way or the other. Yeah. Um, okay, let's move over to the burning of the surface. Yeah, I love this one. <laughs> So August uses Brian Forster, and I'm sure if you ask Brian Forster uh, about the burn marks on the Col uh, Colossi of Menon, he wouldn't say Micronova. Well, I mean, I hope not, because the problem with this is, you know, he's he's saying like, look, everything is melted on 
one side on the eastern side and it's like okay well then and and saying that this is the result of a micronova from the sun and it's like okay well if that's the case then we should be seeing this in every place all over the world boom which is not what we're seeing it's very simple like and i'm not saying that something catastrophic didn't happen here i mean there is evidence of something catastrophic happening at some of these sites right you see like broken stones everywhere or you do see these sort of melted what are these quartzite is that right yeah melted quartzites so, etc but yeah the the twin statues um the colossus of menon they depict amenhotep the third which is a 14th century bc uh pharaoh and they <laughs> they project it. They pr pr they show him in a seated position. So these were carved three thousand five hundred years ago. Yeah. So they're old. Now yeah. they're also broken apart, and there's evidence in the area that lots of stuff is broken apart. Yeah. And you're aware of that, correct? Yes, that's what I was just mentioning. Yeah. <clears throat> so they have stood since 1350 BC. Were well known to the Greeks. And the Romans, who scribed the entire statues, are covered in uh, graffiti. Uh, now, what I find interesting is that, where was it? I just thought I had it up here. Jesus Christmas. Um, they were affected by earthquakes here. Soon after the construction, the temple of this area, the temples were destroyed by an earthquake. This is, there's historical evidence. Recently dated by the Armenian Institute of Seismology to 1200 BC, which left only the two huge colossi at the entrance of the building standing. So that's the first earthquake. The colossi are probably cracked up at this point. So, But the whole temple has collapsed in 1200 BC. They were then further destroyed by another earthquake in 27 BC, after they were then partially reconstructed, reconstructed by the Roman authorities. Well, the most obvious problem here, too, is that these statues aren't old enough. If if the theory is correct, which I don't think it is, that we're experiencing a micronova from the sun every 12,000 years, these statues are not old enough to be affected by that because the claim is, is that we're up for another one in 2046. <sighs> Yeah, here's what's more interesting. The 1200 BC earthquake opened up huge chasms in the ground here. So it's a big earthquake. Yeah. And many of the giant statues got buried. And some of them are in pristine condition, not burnt. And they have been <laughs> excavated. <laughs> I mean, to say that these were burnt by a micronova, you have to say that the micronova happened sometime way more recently than 12,000 years ago. Yeah, in the last. 3, I mean, that's years. like that's a ridiculous oversight. Like, I I find that to to be extremely disingenuous and dishonest. Like, you want to suggest that 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 August doesn't know the dates of these statues, or he's or too lazy to go find it. out, or doesn't believe it? That's possible. I considered that, but it's, based on it's what? It's so well documented in the historical data. They know it's Amenhep the third. They know the date it was built. They know the yeah. date it was the temple was destroyed. Right. They didn't make that up. Right. <laughs> it's not like <laughs> this right. is from. Here, here. It's not like okay, this is from ahead. like the old kingdom that we don't really know anything about. You know. Right. Let's go on to being uh, less critical, th more critical thinking, and and more genuineness what we know about tsunamis today suggests that even a small tsunami like the one that, that we call a large tsunami in indonesia mm -hmm. results in complete destruction of everything on the surface and the death of everyone if you're Are in the you're path referring of it, to the what what was that 20 2010 2012 the indonesia tsunami yes. christmas yeah yeah but like i think a million people died well anyone yeah. that was in the path is dead that was that was and here's some crazy. examples. So yeah. everyone dies in a yeah. tsunami, a small yeah. one from an earthquake. Yeah. If we're talking about a tsunami because the earth stops spinning, nothing will survive on the surface of the earth. Yep. 
How could anything survive if a mile of salt water is over top of you for hours? Right. You're going to swim around and then return to the surface? Right. So just thinking about what a mega tsunami means, if the earth were to stop spinning, nothing on earth would survive. Not only yeah. that, all of the fertile land would be saturated with salts and no, every plant and every insect would die. Yeah. The earth would be sterile. Yeah. Well, and then but, what about... But the... that's not brought up. There would be deposits everywhere, uh, over every square foot of every continent and of this catastrophic event. Yes. There's none. You would see, what you would see is a stratigraphic layer indicating that this occurred, right? And that doesn't exist. Or a major unconformity due to its erosional force. Y yeah. Yeah, yeah. Everywhere overlain by new stuff. Yeah. We don't see that. In fact, the Younger Dryas boundary can be found all around here, and it's not a catastrophic erosional surface. Remember, it's a burning surface. It's a black mm -hmm. mat. Mm -hmm. It's not a saltwater deposit of catastrophe and coquino. So yeah. it's just so disingenuous. And then let's go on. This is the I, best I evidence. I was about to ask about this, yeah. The best evidence, you're looking at a 40,000 year old mammoth baby and, and there's not just one. And so the argument is that uh, everything got broken apart. You've heard that, that they're, all the mammoths frozen in the muck are, are broken apart. All their bones are broken. Mm -hmm. Does that look like this to you? No. Yep, here's another one. This is the best preserved baby mammoth, and it still has its fur. That's why it's yeah. considered the best. Yeah. Not broken up, not crushed. It looks like it fell down and got buried. It looks like it got in the middle of functioning. Like he was reaching for a tree branch. <laughs> yeah, like in the middle of doing something, and then boom. And so all these baby woolly mammoths are extremely well preserved. And interestingly enough, they date from various numbers, 30,000 years ago uh, to Yagukir, which is 22,500 years ago. They recently found a 45,000 year old mammoth, which, which appears to be butchered by humans, putting humans mm -hmm. up in the Arctic 45,000 years ago, which is 12,000 years earlier than they have any evidence for humans in the Arctic. It's amazing. Um, and then there's another problem. That mammoths in recent years have been discovered to have lived as recently as 3,900 years ago in the Arctic. <laughs> so none of the well, mammoths... Well, just, just the fact that they're, they're not all dying at the same time, right? I mean, obviously... None of them are. Bit... They're all different times. Right. I mean, there's there's other stuff going on here, obviously, right? Because we do find like flash frozen mammoths and stuff like that. Um, so understanding what that's about is pretty important. But it, <laughs> just because it, it doesn't mean that this all happened 12,000 years ago because of a, a, a Nova. De definitely not. Uh, and a Nova wouldn't particularly fr flash freeze anything. In order to preserve something this amazing, like the mammoth we're looking at here, it needs to be buried. Yeah. It needs to be buried immediately in an anoxic environment that's very cold, and then it can be flash frozen. Yeah. And because these date as old as 45,000 years, it means the area has to be continuously in the cold for 45,000 years, devoid of oceans washing over it and thus and such. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Now, I do believe that there are mucks up in the Arctic that are from the 12,900-year event. Sure. They've, they've been dated. The boneyard is one. Yeah. Uh, that guy was on Joe Rogan. His That's... deposit is part of the Younger Dryas event. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Everything's broken up there. They didn't find any full mammoths. It's just a bone pile. It's a yeah. pile of everything on top of everything. Yeah. So you get that with com cometary air bursts and a catastrophic event melting and mixing that Arctic muck, it being deposited in valleys and it being already minus 50 there. It freezes mm -hmm. over in that in one night. Mm -hmm. No mammoth is going to rot. Nothing's going to start rotting. Yeah. You don't yeah, need not it to only flash freeze in a half anoxic, an hour. What'd what? you say? 
it not only is it buried, reason. <laughs> <laughs> not only is it buried and anoxic, but it's extremely cold. Right, extremely cold to start, and so it's not. It's very hard to get any supporting evidence for Micronova. And because if it did any of the things that they claim it did, we wouldn't be here talking. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's the paper. <laughs> After all that. <laughs> it's an analytical investigation of the theory of Douglas vote regarding recurring solar Nova events every 12,068 years that can explain the catastrophic events of the past. Several claims are difficult to provide a mechanism for, and I give possible ways these periodic changes might be possible. Well, we just went over everything. He, go ahead. I was just going to say terrible title, by the way. Wow. <laughs> just on a, on a, on a, <laughs> as a writing criticism. <laughs> now, there's a couple of problems with the 12,068-year periodicity. If this is a catastrophic event, and it causes the magnetic field to go to zero and the crust and the earth to stop spinning, we would see a 12,000 year signal here in the mm -hmm. earth's magnetic field strength. Mm -hmm. We don't. Right. I'm, <laughs> it's so easily disproven by available data that, again, I say extremely disingenuous. And it's amazing to me that that such a person doesn't see the need to like account for this other data. Like, what I don't understand what their motivation is. Are they just extremely academically lazy, or are they trying to trying to mislead people for a following? It could be a combination of both that you delude yourself so much you believe your own fairy tale. <sighs> Well, and, and and especially if he never checked any of the of, of the other data, I don't even know what is August Dunning's background. He Do is you? a top. He's from NASA. <laughs> well, okay. I mean, we highly be respected. He's this, from NASA, right? but if you look into him, he's selling longevity supplements that make you that defy aging. I mean, it's complete garbage. It's, uh, he's like a snake oil salesman. I mean, maybe I shouldn't be surprised by this, right? Because it's really no different, just a circle here, right? It's really no different than a modern day, you know, global warming scientist who either hasn't bothered to look at the real data about temperatures over the long term and ice in the Arctic and the Antarctic and all of that, or they're just purposely ignoring it because the money is for research is in global warming conclusions. So it's it's one or the other, and it's extremely disingenuous and irresponsible either way. Yeah, but I mean, the, the fact that it, people with a following of over a half a million uh, can dupe their entire uh, follower, all of their followers, while showing them, they actually show the data, but then they claim that the data that you're looking at actually shows a 12,000 year cycle. Right. Well, and, and <laughs> the average person is not going to go look for this graph about magnetic excursions and reversals. Right. So they'll have nothing to compare it to. And so all, the only option is to just take this guy's word for it. I mean, this is the reason why it is so important to do your own critical thinking and try to do some of your own research if you can, or look at, listen to other people talking about similar things because they may be pointing out data that, that the other person didn't bring up. Good point. We should all know that the times coming in the next decade or so are going to be bad uh, simply because of the globalist agenda and the, the way that socio-political things are happening on the globe. That's the mm -hmm. first thing. Yeah. It might be because they know, of, the powers that be know what's coming. And it's not a giant tidal wave, and it's not the Earth stopping rotating. Mm -hmm. um, it is a solar shutdown or a grand minima, which leads to a large volcanic eruption, which will darken the skies and create famine and disease. And they need to keep control of it somehow. Well, and this is, I mean, this is exactly it, right? Like people like Bill Gates who talk about shutting down the sun. I think that he says this because he knows 
it's going to cool. And this way he can take credit for it and say, look, I fixed it. <laughs> Find us tonight. Magnetic Reversal News at 8 p.m. Mountain Time. Listen to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message. 